Excuse me. Can I quit this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I told Eddie Murphy to stay in college so he'd have something to fall back on. <laughs> I did great advice. Exactly. How about the lighter side of history? The lighter oh, side. I got some laughing at my show. Okay. I know a lot of things and I share them on the podcast and you don't care. What are we talking about? We're... I can't get a word in edgewise <laughs> on this show. I mean, it's. Here's how we sell it. Okay. In entertainment and in life, I guess for everybody, there are what I call light bulb moments. And we've discussed different stuff like this. Uh, when you knew you wanted to be in show business or when you knew you wanted to be a comedian and face the wrong way. But there was a very specific time when I knew that I was sitting on something that I never knew I was sitting on. And it was very odd. My sister's boyfriend and I, I, I was reading in the New York Times, which I, it must have been on the floor of my mother's house because I'm never at the New York Times. Right. And the entertainment section, it said how there was this place in New York City where if you waited online, you could go up and do a few minutes of comedy. And I had no intention of ever being any kind of comedian, but I was a joke teller in my bands. And I grabbed Archie and I said, we got to go into this place. So we went in there, got, they're plenty early to sit in the audience and sat right in the front. And the way it worked was, as you well know, people waited in line and they got numbers, one through right. 20 or 30 or 40, and they'd get up for five minutes. And you, for the most part, horrible, uh -huh. but five minutes. And then once in a while, a regular comic comic would get up and do a few minutes and save the day, and then they'd start with the amateurs again. And at some point in the night, the person that was on, five minutes is a really, really long time. It is you know, a, like, a lifetime, an eternity. An eternity. So whoever was on bailed. <laughs> but it was long enough into the show where the, the MC, the, ho the host of the show, is bored. So they go back through the velvet curtain and they're at the bar having a drink or eating a hamburger or whatever. They got five minutes, you know, to do whatever they right. want. Right. But all of a sudden they didn't. And the person just walked off the stage, and there was a bare stage. And this very drunken girl got up and told a very, very bad joke. But the audience was so hungry <laughs> to laugh that she got a big laugh because it was, it, it was a, a, uh, an oasis among no laughs, and she got a laugh. So the MC came back in, I, Kelly Rogers, I think, and said, thank you very much, sit down, you know, yeah, go yeah. have another drink. And then they proceeded with the show. Well, the show went on for another 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half hour, whatever it was. The host was out of the room and whoever was on stage bailed. And here's this opportunity and Archie says, get up there. So I just climbed on stage and I told a joke that was to me, the, the oldest joke in the books that I had been telling since probably seventh grade or fifth grade, <laughs> yeah. and I was, it was a long joke, and I was maybe halfway through it, and Catch a Rising Star is a small place, and the velvet curtain's over there, and as in the course of it, I saw David Say, the host, come back through the velvet curtain, but he let me finish the joke. And it was a very dirty joke, and I finished the joke, and the house came down. I mean, they really, Good. really left, which was great. And I, I knew my place, and I just walked off and sat back down. And I, I felt great. I thought okay. it was fun. So this was Catch a Rising Star. 1977. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Long I started before I ever got near the whole Rodney. Or yeah. 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 So I started at the comic strip audition night. Same situation. The host was Jerry Seinfeld. And in those days, the host made the decision, did you pass, did you not pass? And he passed me on the first night. That's so great. And what that meant was I could hang out late at the comic strip when the schedule was done, and if there was still an audience, I could but go up. But you got to hang with the But guys. I got to hang with the guys. I got to know Jerry Seinfeld right away. He was wearing glasses in those days, jeans and a comic strip t-shirt. We became fast friends. 
actually. And I have a, a true story about Jerry Seinfeld and starting out in comedy and how rough it can be. I would go on stage at two in the morning. I went on at quarter to three in the morning once at the comic strip because they were Three people here, four three, people here. Not even, just three people. Three people. If there was anybody there, the comic strip knew what they had and they were developing comedians. So I go up and there's three people there. And I'm up on stage and I'm new and I'm doing my quote unquote material, if you can call it that. And the lights were in my eyes and I couldn't see, but those three people got up quietly and left. There was no waitress in the room. There was nobody in the room. But I didn't know that the audience left. I wasn't getting laughs, but I didn't get laughs anyway. I just kept going. Jackie, nothing had changed. I, nothing had changed. I kept going. I kept going. And at the comic strip, there was a little window you could look into the room, and Seinfeld was hanging out of the bar, looked through the window, sees that I'm performing to nobody, and I will never, ever forget this as long as I live. He walked down the aisle to the side of the stage where I noticed him, and he looked at me and he said, hey, man. There's nobody here. <laughs> and I just went, oh, okay. Uh, I w so when comics complain, I perform to two people or three people, you I perform to nobody. You got the Trump card. I beat that. That's good. All right, now listen, I did not get to the punchline of my story. Oh. It's not really a punchline. But what happened was, I, that, that, that's, that's a Trump card when anybody talks about playing to nobody. You know, uh -huh. my first time on stage to Catch a Rising Star, I literally was playing to six people before they ran for the door. But I got on stage, and I told that joke, and I got done, and we sat down, and you stayed till the bitter end. You know, we were old drunks with, with nothing to do, so we're staying till the very end. And on the way out, David Say was standing there at the velvet curtain. And he goes, hey, that was a great joke. <laughs> I said, thanks, man. He says, hey, you ever think about doing this? And I said, no, which I really never had. He said. It's a great joke. And I said, yeah, but you knew that joke. And he said, yeah, I never heard that joke. And I am telling you, a bomb went off, you know, the proverbial light bulb, because in my mind, not that I ever thought about it or said it out loud, but in my mind, I grew up in the United States, and I was a young boy, and kids played in the dirt and played with trucks and exchanged dirty jokes as they got older, and I figured, Everybody, every kid in the United States knew all the jokes that I knew. Yeah. And all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, if the host at Catch a Rising Star in Manhattan hasn't heard that joke, maybe there's other people that haven't heard that joke. And it turns out nobody's heard the joke. The people who have have forgotten it. And then you find out that if you tell it well enough, they're going to laugh again. And all of a sudden I realized That's your I was sitting on a treasure trove. Now, never knowing that I was going to milk that, but all of a sudden I realized, wow, you know, there was... So you had that moment with the great, I can say, David Say, who was the MC host, same thing, at Catch a Rising Star. That's your moment. And he's, he, he became a very, very good friend and still is. He was the only guy that was ever plucked out of a club by Carson. By Carson, because he came into Catch a Rising Star, the place was sold out, and Catch a Rising Star, Rick Newman was smart enough to pay off a table. Here, I need this table. Here, take whatever money. Right. And Johnny came in and saw the show and saw David say, and David went on to do quite a number of successful like seven, Tonight Show. David used to yes. say, he has seven Tonight Shows, nine with the reruns. <laughs> and uh, he had such a great story that um, he said, you know, it was so great. He said, I finally got to work in the Catskills when I was just starting. And I went up on stage and had a really good set. And this old lady came up to me after the show and said, you were so good, but I didn't recognize any of your jokes. <laughs> <laughs> they're so used to seeing the same people over and over and over, you know, which is <laughs> the difference between comedy then and comedy now, uh, you know, which is so David great. Say was so funny and such a terrific comedian. He also became a private pilot. And we had a gig together, and he offered to fly me to someplace like Martha's Vineyard, and just something inside me said, no, nah, I'll drive. <laughs> right, right, uh, right. Thanks for the offer. I don't know, it just, a comedian and pilot didn't go I think his together. license plate is literally 
funny pilot. <laughs> no, I'm not making a joke. You know, he's, he's still a pilot down in Florida and flies from gig to gig. You know, it's... It, yes, he is. It's just so exciting. You know? Well, that's your moment when you knew. When you I, knew. I, I don't know what I knew, but I knew I knew something that I didn't know before that happened. You know, it was... Uh, you know who else was discovered by Carson at a club? Freddie Prinz. Absolutely true. Where, like Prince, a, a yes. comedy store or something? Like no, I, no I, I think I'd catch a rising star. Freddie Prinz. Uh, you remember his, I'm a, I'm a Hungarian. And, uh, how, right. Freddie Prinz Jr., of course, became a superstar, but his dad was pretty amazing as well. He, he uh, tragic suicide, of course. Right, right. Th th this is so long ago, you have to Google him. Freddie Prince, but it was Freddie, but Freddie Prince, Prince and Jack was, Albertson. Yes, and, and they were on the top of the world. And, and he just couldn't handle that much success that fast. Right. You know. Wow. Right. And I work with Jimmy Walker, who told me that he used to hang out with Freddie Prince, and Freddie Prince was in television comedy at the same time. That John Travolta was a sweat hog, and apparently Freddie Prince had a passionate hatred for John Travolta and together with Jimmy Walker they went to John Travolta's house in Hollywood and somehow Freddie Prinze had a bow and arrow and they knocked on the door and the maid came to the door and the bow and arrow went off and hit the door and missed the maid and they ran off Be and to this day Travolta was trying to come I, I think they a, were competitive they were competitive just you know young Comics competitive in, in television at the time. I don't, uh, uh, the way Jimmy Walker tells us it, uh, Fred, John Travolta to this day doesn't know who shot that arrow. That's so wacky. It oh, is, it's really, really wacky. You know, I uh, was on the road so long ago that Rich Jenny was the middle act and I was the headliner. Uh, Rich Jenny, another tragic suicide, uh, and the word brilliant go together. Right. You can't talk for five minutes about the old days without stumbling over a suicide, which is so I know. sad. But, That's, uh, it is sad. But Jenny and me were on the road, and the way it worked at some of these clubs, if all of a sudden they got a major headliner to do a night, everybody else got shuffled back. So I was headlining, Jenny was middle, and I guess there was a local MC, but Jimmy Walker, they got him at last minute booking for like a Friday and Saturday, so I became the middle act and Jenny became the opening act, and it was when Jimmy Walker was on his way, he had been such a major star, but now was back to work in clubs. I, I don't know how many, two years later, 10 yeah. years later, I yeah. don't know. And all I can remember is all the crowd wanted him to do was say dynamite, and he <laughs> would not do it. I, th I think to this day, he will not do it, and it, it's like, do yourself a favor that they, they'd get so angry, you know. I know. He's, Jimmy Walker's still out there doing comedy. And, and I'll bet I've you anything, he's still not saying, if you see Jimmy Walker, ask him to say dynamite. But, but he does sell memorabilia afterwards. And uh, he's such a nice guy. And, and I, I love working with him. He's very funny backstage. Tells correct, Well, obviously, he told me that story about John Travolta. Right, right, and right. And the arrow. Uh, he so, was there in the way, uh, way, way beginning. Yeah, you know. he was there at the absolute beginning. And he told me he came within an inch. He's still mad he didn't get cast in, in Hee Haw. I thought I had it. I thought I had it. Oh, that's I can so see good. him being so great wow. on, on Hee Haw. But you mentioned, you know, Rich Jenny. Uh, Joe Rogan, okay, who's got a very, very successful career and podcast now, mentioned this on his podcast not too long ago. Me, Joe Rogan, Rich Jenny on the show at the East Side Comedy Club. All right. Rogan remembers this. He mentioned it on his podcast. I remember it. I'm mentioning it now. Rich Jenny did four shows, four separate hours, not repeating material. And if you're a comedian, that is amazing. That is incredible. It's amazing enough to have an hour and then discard that and, and do, do a, a, second a second hour. hour. But four. He did four. And Rogan and I couldn't believe it. I still can't believe it. That's how amazing Rich Denny was. And, and God rest his soul. Terrific, I terrific hope I guy. didn't tell this story yet, and I don't think I did. Did I t talk about Savannah? I don't think so. So we're on the road, and we did Atlanta, but not the punchline. The Atlanta 
comedy shop or whatever it was, and Columbia, Georgia, which I didn't know even know existed, and Savannah, Georgia. We did like four or five stops driving, mm -hmm. and uh, together twenty four seven. So we were bonded immeasurably from that point on. Four or five weeks of, you know, and we'd play tennis, and he'd do an entire Richard Pryor album, and I'm trying to play tennis, which I can't do anyway, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, we just get to Savannah, and in Savannah, there's a woman. I, I think it's called the Lady of the Harbor or something. There's a statue of a woman, kind of like this, or holding her hat. And the story being that her husband left to go fight in the Civil War, and that she went down to the dock every day and stood there looking for him. And meanwhile, he got killed in the war, but she's down there every yeah, day yeah. for years waiting for him to come. And Jenny, he opening night, he goes, you know, I can't believe you people. I just saw this statue. This woman's husband went, <laughs> went to war. And there's a statue of this woman standing there waiting for him every day. He said, we left New York. A half hour later, I called my apartment and the paper boy answered. <laughs> but the, the point of the story is we're both very new. And he, he was probably even more new than I was. And we're in Savannah, Georgia. And in those days, like even in Jersey and New York on Long Island, you're doing comedy. We talked about that. You're doing comedy, and these people are facing the wrong way, and they're trying to swallow the concept of people their own age yes. trying to be funny. Like, who, do you, who, may, who died? Made, made you boss. <laughs> so forget about doing it in the South and being Yankees. Right. So we're in Savannah, Georgia, in this little tiny club that was really a small bar, restaurant, but they're having comedy. All booked by the same guy, here, here, here. And if you're a comic, there is nothing more entertaining than watch another, watching another comic go right. to the toilet. Right. Another comic do really bad. Bombing. Bombing. And it's so funny, because I've always said that if, if you're bombing on stage, there's always a distinct rhythmic pattern. You tell your joke, and there's silence, and then there's the roar of the comics in the back because they want to make sure that you know that they heard how silent it was after your joke. Which is, which is, you can almost dance to it, so funny. <clears throat> so Jenny is on stage, and I'm sure the guy who said this was not trying to be funny. I would love to think maybe he was, but, you know. And Jenny's on stage, and he's doing terrible. And he starts doing Jewish material. We're in Savannah, Georgia in 1982. I think if you did Jewish jokes now, it's Savannah, Georgia. <laughs> hey, a new episode of Stand Up Memories every Wednesday. How exciting is that? Starring me, Peter Bales, and... Right here, Jackie the Joke Man Martin. Please follow us on social media. Search it out. What is it? MySpace? MySpace? Your space? TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Do da, do da. <laughs> <laughs>